everybody. Yeah, this has been a very, very widely requested topic. So, I've given it my best shot. We will see how things progress. This is VGT 2020 team building. All right, we're gonna get started. So, <clears throat> this is Pokemon Academy lecture number four. My name is Mr. Glick. Um, the date is March 20th. So, before we begin, there's a couple things we need to address, and, and that is that team building as a concept is very difficult to talk about. There are some things that most people can agree on, um, and I've included some of those here, but in general, there are teams that tend to break all the rules and still do well. Um, another reason that team building is so incredibly difficult is that in VGC, the rules change every year, meaning each and because the rules change with a different format comes different things that are rewarded in team building. So for that reason, it's a very difficult topic to cover because I could maybe give you good advice for VGT 2020, but it maybe won't apply in VGT 2021 if I were to go too specific, right? Um, like if I were to tell you, if I were to have told you Intimidate is 100% is essential on a team, in, and if they had, you know, done this a year ago and it was VGC 19, it wouldn't necessarily apply in VGC 2020 as much. Both my regionals teams, which got first and second at regionals, did not have Intimidate. So, um, for that reason, it's hard to set hard and fast rules when we're talking about team building. That being said, I've done, I think, I've given my best effort at making a general guide and going into specifics, not in terms of format, but in terms of concepts. So, let's see if I can, please? Okay. So, okay, let's start off very basic. And this is something that I think is really important to talk about and make sure you all have a good grasp on, which is that what is team building? What does that mean? So unlike most other games, almost every other games, Pokemon has two phases, unlike most other games, which have one. The phase that most people think about when they consider Pokemon is the game itself. The plays, the players, the reads, the hacks, luck, whatever you want to call it, the tournament gameplay, essentially, or the match gameplay. Um, you know, everyone can think of a, a crazy play that they've seen that they really were impressed by. Uh, but the thing is that this is only half of the game. The other half, <clears throat> which is extremely different than many, many other games, for example, I've listed some here, chess, smash, soccer, ping pong, fork knife, etc., is the preparation phase. In Pokemon, you have millions of options for customization before the tournament begins, or the match begins, whatever. Um, however, in tournament, once you start, you're locked in. Uh, team building is the major part of the game that happens before the matches begin. So let's go ahead and move on from here. So let's think about team building. Like I said, an enormous part of what makes Pokemon unique as a game is the as this aspect of team building. The example that I like to give, or one of the examples that I like to give, is chess, right? Um, imagine that you were playing chess, but you weren't able to tell how a pawn would move, or, you know, maybe how, what a pawn, like, maybe what if there was a pawn that had two lives, right? Or what if there was a pawn that on the first turn could move three spaces instead of two, right? So the pieces could have been significantly influenced before the game began, and the thing is that you wouldn't know. Uh, you wouldn't know how these pieces, how your opponent's specific chess pieces could move until you had actually seen them move a couple times, right? Or if you're really, let's say you're really, you're a veteran chess player, you see a move once, maybe you can make some assumptions. Another example is imagine you were playing Super Smash Brothers and the knockback, hit stun, damage dealt, etc. They could all be influenced before the, before the game began, depending on how the players train their characters. Uh, I never played Smash 4, so I feel like this was something that happened to Smash 4. Um, I, or imagine, I guess to a lesser degree, imagine you were playing with spirits in Smash, right? And you couldn't tell before the game. So this is kind of what we're, what we're thinking about, what we're working with here. Bruh. The way that Pokemon is played is that, you know, there are specific EVs and IVs and natures and held items and four specific moves. And there's a bunch of other abilities and other things as well that all influence how a Pokemon actually ends up being used. Uh, Ray Rizzo, who the most of you should know, he's the three-time world champion. Uh, he revolutionized the game in 2011 when he won the world championships with a defense of Thunderous. Um, those of you who played in 2012 or 2013, to a certain degree, I mean definitely 2015 and a certain degree 16 as well, know that Thunderous was a Pokemon that dominated for many of those years. It was very, very, very difficult to beat. And back in the day, people only used it offensively. You know, they give it max speed and max special attack, Sometimes they would use uh, Electric Gem, for those of you remember that, but it was it was a glass cannon basically. It has really high base speed and base special attack. It's naturally, it's the obvious role for it. And Ray, what Ray did um, was he used bulky Defense of Thunderous. It was bold, I believe, and um, used it as a supportive Pokemon thanks to its Prankster ability. And uh, I think he had a Charty Berry bar on, on it as well to extend its longevity. So Ray's decision to train Thunderous in this specific way 
it revolutionized the game for literally years to come. Um, it was a brilliant, brilliant innovation. I don't know if he came up with it himself or he um, was inspired by Japanese players. I assume he did it himself, but I, I don't know. Yeah. So the fact is that not only was the innovation, you know, especially clever and, and especially intelligent, he also had the surprise factor in addition to that. So people playing against Ray for the first time at the World Championships, they would see Thunderous and they would make assumptions, right? Like we all do. It's in human nature uh, to make assumptions about the game and about, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't actually consider all options. So people would assume that Ray's um, Thunderous was offensive and when he beat them with, you know, then he would have an advantage when, you know, it would survive a hit or it would survive two hits um, or it would use Thunder Wave and stick around for longer or taunt, whatever it is, right? Um, so not only did he get the advantage for innovating, he also got the advantage for information, which is huge. Um, imagine you were playing against Fox in Melee, and all of a sudden, somebody had figured out a way to get, you know, Fox super armor. That would, that would be ridiculous, right? And you probably wouldn't have time to innovate on the fly. Maybe in Melee it's a little different, because you can change the way that you play, but yeah, it, uh... It, it, it's, it was a ridiculous innovation. The differences, so the differences in how Pokemon are used and, and the, cho the choices players make in t the team building phase, uh, they get less attention, right? Like sometimes people will say, oh, like that was cool, right? That's a cool tech, but it doesn't really get the same attention as, as gameplay. Uh, a player who makes a flashy read will be praised much more than a player who has some cool um, innovation on their team. For example, at the North American Internationals last season, I was playing against James Beck, a very good player who finished top four in the world that year um, at the World Championships, and we were playing on stream, and if I won, I would make top cut, and if he won, he would make top cut, so it was a win and in for the tournament, which is, you know, it was huge, and game one, I, you know, it's not going amazing for me, but at some point, I'm able to switch my incinerator in as he goes for a spore, and I reveal for the only time it happened all tournament that I was safety goggles and incinerator, right? And even though it didn't come up for the entire tournament until that moment, that item won me the game and therefore allowed me to win the tournament so it's it's very i don't know it's it's these things are ridiculously important and they don't really get that much attention because they're not as noticeable right and it's not always even held items it's, it's sometimes it's very subtle things like for example maybe a torkoal runs not minimum speed right maybe torkoal's trying to outspeed dust clops outside of trick room something like that could have a really big impact on the game so let's continue so I've just told you a bit about why team building is so important and also why it's really cool. The interesting thing to me is that a lot of players actually don't team build. A lot of even established VGC players, players who have top cut the world championships have done it with teams that didn't build themselves. Often this happens actually, it's, it's extremely common. I'm, I would actually be curious if we had more players top cutting with teams they built themselves or just teams they borrowed or stole or you know, had, had given to them or whatever. And this is fine, there's nothing wrong with not building your own teams. There was a period where I kind of felt like it was wrong. Not wrong, but like I felt like you were cheating yourself in a way because there's advantages and disadvantages, right? But it's fine to not build your own teams. Um, the fact of the matter is that team building is extremely difficult and it takes a lot of practice and oftentimes it does take failure. I'm going to interrupt myself a little bit here and just talk about I've always built my old, own teams. I think there was maybe one tournament where I didn't use my own team in it. Um, and... It's something that's like important to me, right? I enjoy building my own team. I'm not against working with other people. I'm not against taking inspiration. But at the end of the day, the idea always comes from me. Um, and I, st I had in my early VGC career, I had I had a lot of success. I won regionals and nationals, and I got to top eight at worlds in my first season, and then I got second at regionals, first nationals, and second at worlds. All with teams I built myself, right? With some help, right? I had help, but um, with with teams where I was a crucial part of the process, right? And then I took the wrong lessons from my teams, right? And I said. I didn't, I didn't, you know, analyze properly and I didn't say, oh, Wolf, you're doing well because you made really good meta calls and you had some creative stuff, which gave you the element of surprise. But overall, you were like innovating in a creative way, but like your innovations were smart, right? Instead, what I did was um, I said, Wolf, you're winning because you're so creative and everything you do is so off the wall and that's making you win, right? Which was the wrong lesson. And so, so what happened was if you look at my 2013 season, I did very poorly. I didn't top cut a single event. I got top 32 at Worlds. I, you know, got top 16 at Regionals. Like it was, it was a huge step down from my earlier seasons. And the lessons that I, that I gained from that, from that season of spending the entire year working on a single team that was not good that had Gliscor and Magmar and Registeel and then had on all this stuff, right? I, I realized that, you know, the lessons, yeah, the lessons I had taken were wrong and, and I built really bad habits. And so my fifth, my 13th season was pretty much building bad habits and the 14th season was a lot of unlearning them, right? And even, you know, some of those bad habits every once in a while will pop back up. I think I'm mostly past them now, but it took years to 
uh, on learning. There's a lot of failed tournaments that I failed because, you know, I would I would fall back into my old ways, um, building too defensively, not having enough offensive pressure, which is fine, right? And I think that I became better as a team builder for it. But again, it took lots of failure. So it's, you know, not everyone is going to want to go through that. And, and that's a hard thing to do as well. Granted, I didn't think I was going to fail at the time. I wasn't doing it with the intention of failing. I thought I was going to win the world championships. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, so like, I let's continue on. Many players prefer to rely on friends or they'll focus heavily on scouting to look for teams they can use or adapt. This is, um, scout. when I say scouting here, there are many players who will just kind of fix themselves to online ladders, whether it be simulators or mostly simulators because it's easier for them. They don't have to play themselves, but some people will look at Battle Spot as well, whatever it's called, Battle Stadium as well. Yeah, so th that's, how, uh, that's how they do it. They also, within most circles, I would say, there are people who are known for team building um, or there are just people who, you know, build teams and enjoy it and they they hand it out so they just, or they just hand it out to their friends and you know they get spread that way so yeah or players will take the standard thing as well they'll say i know this team does well um i didn't include this in lecture or like on the slide but yeah sometimes players will just say hey this team won the last event it's got to be good right like i can just use it another reason that people don't team build for themselves is that and i mentioned this earlier but oftentimes specific team building skills will not translate from metagame to metagame so someone could be an amazing builder for 19 but struggle to find their rhythm in 20 for example um and different metagames reward different things in team building so yeah so that's those are some reasons people don't team build now i'm going to tell you why you should team build um first of all it's fun and it's extremely rewarding and by rewarding what i mean here is there's for me there's something and i'm just speaking from my own personal experience right now <clears throat> but i find like having an idea and workshopping it and finding a way to make it work is a really really satisfying process and you know i'm biased because again i, I almost always use my own teams um so that's kind of my angle here but um you know there's 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 a certain sense of pride that i take in, in my teams and in my work and I, I don't know if that's something that you feel when you don't build your own teams right um and it's also a unique way of self-expression right maybe i'm gonna lose some of you here but a lot of people have their own styles of building right and if you're really really familiar with the, with like people who you know are known for building you might even be able to recognize like oh this looks like a sajin team or like oh this looks like something ashton would use back in the day right and you know having having a way to express yourself and to and to and to do things in a way that makes sense to you i think is really fun also i just want to say really quickly that, that it's not like there's people who build and there's people who don't build at all like it's not, people who build all their own teams and you know something else people who only borrow there's a lot of in between there's a lot of gray area sometimes people will take bases from other people and then build on it and innovate yeah so pre pretty much do whatever you want but yeah the other thing is that when you do not build your own teams you are at the mercy of others for events right especially for events with deadlines um and i like to be in control of my own fate that's something that i value uh, that's something that i care about and so that's an advantage but also it also means that when you know when there's an event coming up and you didn't find anything good you might be less likely to accept help and therefore, you know, use something bad or you might, you might have hung on longer, um, to, to, you know, a bad idea of your own rather than using a good idea of somebody else's. Those are things that I'm guilty of. So there's not like a right or wrong way to do things. Um, and lastly, the only way to get better at building is to do it a lot. I, I'm sure that most people, if they had the choice of like building a good team themselves or getting a, a good team from somebody else. They would normally choose building it themselves, but people lack confidence and it's, it's very difficult. Um, so yeah. Uh, and some people it comes easier to do than others, but normally experience will always, will almost always improve you. Not always, but almost always. So I have two main methods when I team build, and I'm going to tell you about them right now. So the first method I want to talk to you about is reactive slash defensive thinking. There's definitely team stealing, 100%. Yeah, this happens to me actually a lot, which is why I try to ladder almost not as much. Um, yeah, so anyway, reactive slash defensive team building. This method involves analyzing the prevalent threats in the metagame, primarily offensive threats, um, and determining the defensive tools capable of handling them. This involves things such as making use of immunities and resistances, aka typing, uh, finding ways of weakening threats such as status, intimidate, snarl, um, speed control, especially for frailer Pokemon, um, and finding ways of mitigating opponent, opposing Dynamax. This is more format, maybe generation specific. So, yeah, basically finding defensive checks to your opponent's pokemon so let's talk about a common example which is excadrill players need to find ways of mitigating the enormous damage output and dealing with the threatening high base speed stat especially when you consider sandstream and the fact that it can just double its um, speed stat but also taking into account excadrill's threatening bulk after max moves and dynamax hp buff so i talk about bulk here because it's not like you can just run mock punch conqueror with flame orb or choice band and one shot it right 
Um, you have to go a little bit further than that because extra drill, you know, which is Dynamax, is, is HP doubles. Um, and thanks to its stab moves, raising its defensive stats, it becomes very difficult to remove from the field. And so how do you mitigate that, right? How do you waste Excadrill's Dynamax turns? How do you lower the damage output? What if it has Swords Dance? What if it has Life Orb? These are questions you need to ask yourself because there's going to be times where the, like, Excadrill will hit the field and you're going to need to react to it, right? We're not going to, we're not going to have something faster that can one-shot it or, um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about this. Defensive tools are especially important when you consider switching. Having a team with no immunities to ground, for example, will not only cause Eduardo to yell at you, it's his birthday, happy birthday, um, but it will also signal to your opponent that there's no drawback for them clicking Max Quake. Uh, if your Arcanine, sorry, Arcanine is on the field, and your opponent knows that they can safely Max Quake, like they know that your every Pokemon on your team is weak to ground or neutral to ground, um, they can do that 100% safely, right? Unless they expect Protect, but let's say you just Protected, right? Um, however, if you've already revealed Token Kiss, or you have it on your team at least, or you've Rotom or something, you have the ability to, at the very least, make a prediction to waste a turn of their Dynamax, right? And now your opponent is thinking, if I Max Quake and they switch to Rotom or Togekiss, I waste my Dynamax attack. But if I Max Steel Spike and they Will-O-Wisp, I get burned. So, yeah. So, it, it, it basically, even though it's not... It's a, it's a start. This is, obviously, Token Kiss is not an Excadrill counter. Most Token Kiss are not an Excadrill counter. Some could definitely do it, but... In general, Togus is not considered an extra counter, but it's not always about ha like having good synergy on your team allows Pokemon to um, to pivot and to and to switch around, and so that's important for mitigating offensive threats, especially if you consider Togekiss because Togekiss is follow me. So if your partner is a, you know getting Togekiss in safely, let's do the reverse example. Let's say you're running Mono Fairy and every Pokemon team is weak to Steel, and you have Sylveon on the field, and you really want Togekiss in so your partner can deal with the Art Excadrill. If they know they can Steel Spike freely. They can just do that, but if they, you know, if they know that steel spiking might let them, you go into Arcanine, which is an even op more obvious switch. Yeah, do you understand what I'm saying here? In this format, in particular, Dynamax is such a large buff, buff to offense, so um, finding ways to manage it and to waste turns of Dynamax is crucial. That's why I talk about switching between Arcanine and Token Gives in this example, because this is my favorite song. I used to put this on back in the day. Who remembers? I used to put this on every single video. Video. Every single video of mine used to have this is the Reggie theme. I, I like heard it and I was like, well. Anyway, um, yeah, so the thing about switching between Arcanine and Togekiss in, in this format in particular is really important because in the past you might say switching in your Togekiss doesn't get you anything because, yeah, like, it's still extra on the field, it can just Iron Hedge you the next turn, but on the one hand you can reset your Intimidate, which is good, on the other hand you could waste a turn to Dynamax, which is huge. Let's move on. The other thing here about this is that you can't just think in a vacuum, right? I've been talking a lot about Excadrill, but let's, let's, switch, let's switch for a moment and let's talk about Dragapult. So... Let's say I have a team that that is very Dragapult weak, but I haven't finished building, I haven't added all the Pokemon, and I'm scrolling through and I'm looking at Pokemon that are fairy type, right? I'm, I'm looking for Pokemon that are fairy type because that is immune to dragon, and I'm also looking for Pokemon that are dark or normal type because um, they resist ghosts. So I'm trying to, I'm really trying to beat uh, Dragapult, and I come across Grimmsnarl, right? And I'm saying, oh, Grimmsnarl's great here. I could run Sucker Punch for Priority Stab. I could run Prankster Thunder Wave to mitigate Dragapult's speed, which allows my partner Pokemon to, to do it. This is great. I just beat Dragapult with one Pokemon. That's awesome. However, you can't think about Pokemon just like this one-on-one, -on -one, right? Because we're not playing singles, we're playing doubles. When you consider Dragapult on its own, you don't think about the partner. You also don't think about the potential switches. But yeah, you're not thinking about the partner. So let's take Dragapult's probably... Let's think about Dragapult's most likely most common partner with Togekiss. So if my opponent is Dragapult and Togekiss on the field, my Grimmsnarl, which I've used to try and counter, Grimmsnarl, which I've used to try and counter the Dragapult, can't really do very much because my Thunder Wave will get redirected, I can't use Sucker Punch, and I'm weak to Togekiss as well. So um, that allows Dragapult to really just go to ham on the rest of my team, which, you know, because Grimmsnarl can't get rid of it fast enough. And without Thunder Wave, I can't really um, accurately, accurately deal with it. So, in order to accurately team build to counter the metagame, you have to have a good understanding of what is common, right? And also, just to be clear, with this method, I'm mostly talking about if you're trying to win a tournament, right? If you just want to use dumb Pokemon and have fun, or if you just want to build for fun, like, go for it. I'm not telling you you have to do this whenever you build a team, but I'm talking about specifically, I'm trying to teach you to, um, to build a team for a tournament that can win you a tournament, or at least the thinking that can get you there. Um, so, with all that being said... The first step when you build a team most of the time, before you add a single Pokemon, should be to assess what is popular right now. What you po what what is popular, um, what you expect to be popular at the tournament you're attending or in the format you're playing. So that's method one. I'm going to pause here. Do we have any questions specifically about method one? Does method one consider stall tactics? If stall 
That's a tough question. I would. It depends what you mean by stall. Stall doesn't really make that much sense in VGC unless you're talking about like Coil Milotic or Stockpile Gastron or something. But other than that, if I have Milotic to like counter Durant, it's fine as long as Durant can't just like wail on your partner. Like your your Pokemon has to be able to, to actually do something when you switch in, right? Um, whether it's waste Dynamax turns or affect status or threaten them in some way. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. The second way of team building, and this is actually, so I'm going to give you guys a full disclaimer. Method one comes way easier to me, but it's not, it's only half of the, the formula that I, that I like to use. Um, offensive team building. So the Enfuego theory states that the best way to not get hacked is to not let your opponent make any moves. Um, and he's right. You can't get crit if you, your opponent doesn't get to attack. The, you can't get flinched if your opponent doesn't get to attack, right? Um, your opponent can't set up on you and, you know. Basically, the, the general idea is the longer, the more moves your opponent makes, the higher the probability that some luck will go in their favor. So, the best way to not let your opponent make any moves is to move before them and KO them. Because if you KO a Pokemon before it moves, it doesn't get to attack that turn, which is an extremely crucial interaction in Pokemon. So, the second thing to consider when team building, in a very general sense, I'm just speaking generally, um, is offense. Something oppressive that disrupts your opponent's strategy is equally important to a defensive backbone. This is the idea that... The best defense is a good offense, right? The best off sorry, the best offense is a good defense, I should say. Um, because that's the saying, so I should say it. Um, and Fuego was an old school VGC player. Very, very, very good back in the day. 2010, I think it was his first year, and he played um he top cut worlds multiple times, 2011 and 2012, top four and top eight. Yeah, an old friend of mine as well. Anyway, so this doesn't make sense intuitively, right? How is having frail Pokemon offense normally is frail as well? But having an offensive Pokemon, how does that help me defensively, right? Pokemon can't do everything. There's very few Pokemon that are offensive and defensive. So how does this help? And the reason is that if I ha let's say let's let's think in a let's say in a vacuum, right? Let's say I have Final Gambit on my Excelgor, right? And I I'm always moving first, and I can guarantee that my my opponent does not have Protect, so I can guarantee get a KO on something. If I trade my Excelgor for one of their Pokemon, that's one less Pokemon they have to break through my defense, right? Um, that's one less threat they get to use. Uh, on the other hand, if you're putting out damage with your offensive Pokemon, your opponent has to, like, use resources, just like you have to use resources to deal with their threats. They have to use it to deal with to deal with your own threats. So, using offensive Pokemon and using them to break down an opposing team so that, ideally, you don't even have to rely on your defensive, like, part of the team is really important. So, Pokemon that do this well, fast Pokemon, speed is really important in this, and we're going to keep touching back on this. But the fact of the matter is that a fast Pokemon is important. Fast Pokemon, or not fast Pokemon, but having speed control, attacking before your opponent is really important for offense because po uh, normally offensive Pokemon, we can even look at this list, Durant, Charizard, Dragapult, and Teleon, Pokemon are all relatively frail, right? They're not known for their exquisite defenses. They're not known for, for being especially defensive, right? And so uh, for that reason, if they take too many hits, they're just going to go down, right? Durant has pitiful special defense. Inteleon's not super bulky. Charizard has a lot of common weaknesses, um, dra like, all these Pokemon can be one-shot. It's not crazy to think that. Like, if they get one-shot, if I told you my Durant got one-shot, no one would be that surprised, I think. So, what I'm saying is that being able to attack before your opponent can move is a really good way of, um, putting on pressure. Because if you can, if you can deal a lot of damage or KO them, especially in a format with max moves, like, if Durant can raise its defense before the opponent attacks, that's one less attack it has to take, right? And if you force your opponent to play defensively, like, and a good way to force your opponent to play defensively is to move before them because you threaten a lot more pressure. So, speed is important. However, you don't need fast Pokemon with high base speed, right? A Pokemon that is extremely offensive and extremely oppressive is Torkoal. Even though Torkoal is base 20 speed, it's one of the slowest in the game, right? And the reason for that is that you're not thinking, again, this is why we don't think in a vacuum. Torkoal on its own... Let's say I was like, okay, well, if you have, you have your team has to beat Torkoal and no support. I'd be like, yeah, easy. It's slow. I can just beat it up, right? I just don't set Trick Room for it. However, what happens if Torkoal's paired with Dusclops, an extremely bulky Trick Room setter, and I, can't, I don't have a way of stopping Dusclops from getting Trick Room up? Then Torkoal can come in at the right time and just fire off enormous, enormous attacks. Um, and then I don't have great answers to it, right? Especially if it's holding a Choice Specs or a Life Orb or a Charcoal, Charcoal, Torkoal, right? Weakness policy, Rhyperior as well, right? Rhyperior is known for when a Dynamax is having good bulk, it boosts its special defense with both of its stab moves effectively, and uh, Dusclops can bulldoze it to give it a, an attack boost as well. So it's very difficult to switch into. D Rhyperior on its own isn't that threatening. You can easily ignore it, um, or you can at least not proc the weakness policy as bad special defense. You can just chunk it. Um, but when you throw in Dusclops and you throw in Bulldoze, you maybe throw in even Ally Switch, it becomes very dangerous. So 
having speed control is really important. We had Trickroom in our Collinsville team, and at Dallas, we had Tailwind and Trickroom. So we had Whimsicott with Tailwind and Fake Tears, allowing Charizard and Duraludon to become much more threatening. We also had Trickroom to support Conkeldur and that was and, and Jellicent itself. So, yeah. Any question? Well, actually, let's finish Method 2. So let's talk a little bit more about Method 2. The thing is that offensive team building, it requires a very, very different way of thinking about the game than defensive team building, team building um, and the scale can be different as well. So a Pokemon like Durant, like, again, similarly to how there's there's not... It's not like all players build or all players steal. There's a continuum between them. Having an offensive Pokemon on your team doesn't necessarily make your team a hyper-offense team, right? Um, so in this example, a Pokemon like Durant can work when the team is entirely built around it. So we're thinking like a hyper-offensive play style. Or it can be merely a piece of an on an overall defensive team. Like Eduardo used an OCIC, I remember that one. Even to a, in a certain extent how um, Andrew Ding, his team in the finals, which was built by Justin Ramirez, as I recall... Um, Durant was like, it, it, it served a very offensive role, but it was, it also helped protect Milotic and Sylveon and Tyranitar. All this Pokemon really benefited, especially Milotic in the finals, benefited from Max Steel Spike, making it extremely physically bulky. And, and so even though Durant was an offensive Pokemon, it was used on a defensive team. I think that's actually a really good example. Um, or maybe the team wasn't defensive, but that match was played as if it was a, t a defensive team with a Milotic endgame. So, yeah, so even though the, t you know, Andrew Ding, his goal was you know, to win with my Lodic in the end, he used Durant to enable that. And, and Max moves really, really buff that, right? Um, because I was forced to focus on the Durant and um, there was a passive benefit. And every turn that Durant attacked, my Lodic became even more threatening. Offensive Pokemon are typically frailer, which in the past has made super offensive strategies more volatile. However, Dynamax changes that a bit because Dynamax allows frail Pokemon to become bulky. And that's a, for three turns. And that's on a team that outputs a lot of damage, three turns is quite a lot. So Hyper Offense got a huge, huge buff this year. Um, let's talk about, okay, any questions on method two, offensive team building? The way in which you offensive team build is you, like, it. I, it's harder for me to talk, like, to put into words, so I'm just gonna try and do it off the, off the cusp, but a lot of the time you think about, like, offensive combinations rather than the defensive. So I say, like, Togekiss, like, offensive Togekiss. Um, if I run, like, let's say the first person to use offensive Togekiss, right? They're like, okay, well, Fairy, Flying, and Fire... Very few Pokemon can switch into that, right? And then maybe you pair it with Excadrill, like Togekiss Excadrill, because Excadrill benefits from the max uh, flying moves. Maybe you could do your Excadrill Swords Dance, and, um, the f like, you know, not that many Pokemon resist it, but, like, Tyranitar, for example, doesn't love... Like, it could take a hit from, from Max Starfall, so you pair Excadrill with it, or, um... And, you know, Togekiss, like, threatens Conglider, which beats Excadrill, um, and Excadrill can, like, excuse me, help against other Excadrill as well, because you, you know, Corn Sash and High Horse Power, so... All this stuff, basically. <gasps> Excuse me. Does Method 2 always require hard speed control, like Tailwind and Trick Room? I'm going to say not always. Like, Inteleon or Durant, um, Pokemon that are naturally fast can do it, can, like, get around it. And some teams make use of, like, attacking second because they go for, rather than speed and power, they go for power and bulk. Yeah. But there's not really that many always rules in team building, right? That's kind of the thing, something I want to impress on you is that it's not most things are not 100 percent in team building most rules can be broken yeah yeah so i would i would say generally yes like speed control is really good but it also depends on format right and it also depends on metagame so if no one's running speed control and everyone's running like weird bulky offense like middling offense stuff maybe you don't need it let's move on general things that are that are important uh speed control <laughs> generally important not always important um generally important attacking first is a big deal i i call bull honky control honky is supposed to be a different word but i'm family friendly for the most part so um we're gonna use a bull honky control so bull honky control i refer to as general things you don't want to deal with right and by that i mean status moves like sleep definitely goes into the bull honky category um having things atop sleep like terrains are important frankly accuracy uh, I generally hate to use low accuracy moves. I ran both Thunder and Focus Blast on my Reuniclus in Collinsville, and I lost a couple years off my life clicking those moves. Like, I generally hit and got lucky, but don't run low accuracy moves because they're not consistent unless you like to live... Like, some people like low accuracy moves. I lost to somebody at Nationals last year who... Uh, Gary Chan, actually, who I played again in, um, in Collinsville in Top 16, but yeah, he led Smeargle Mewtwo versus me in turn one. Um, Smeargle got plus speed, minus accuracy, and then he lovely kissed all of my Pokemon. So sometimes it will work, right? Uh, I hate Sleep Powder because it's inaccurate. I hate I hate moves that are inaccurate in general. I hate going below 90% accurate and even that. Like, I got knocked out of Dallas Regionals because I missed a Draco Meteor, right? And that's going to happen. So having, like, generally 
putting as much of the game in your own control as possible uh, is good. It's a good thing. So consider accuracy. Generally, status or uh, stat control is good. Like lowering stats is very good. This format is not as important, but generally having intimidate is good. Having a snarl is good. It's not normally going to hurt you. It's just not as essential as in the past. Um, and I love taunt. Taunt is a great bull hunky control because it stops hypnosis, sleep powder, yawn, uh, trick room, tailwind. It's just and it stops protect as well, so it eases predictions. Um, so yeah, yeah. So yeah, taunt. I really like it's a great it's a great thing to have on a team you don't need all the stuff bowling control is really good I, that's like kind of the these top two are the most important ones but honestly everything is useful here um general team building rules this uh, the first one is the most important here your pokemon and team should be doing the work for you not the other way around like your po ideally your team makes it easy for you to win this is especially relevant to players who are good uh like especially good and can win with suboptimal things like this is a problem i run into a lot when i'm team building is that i'll have an idea that i like and I win my games, but like, I will have to work hard and I'll have to play well. The, uh, the perfect team you would have, you, would, you wouldn't even have to play well and you would just win because the team would be that good, right? So that's the ideal. Um, and even if you can play well in practice by like playing out of your mind and making hard reads and being really smart, in tournament especially, you're going to run out of stamina and then you will be tired. So, uh, and then you might not be able to play as well. So yeah, I recommend everyone be results oriented, especially if you, if you have a tendency to use unorthodox stuff, myself included. Um, I generally, I really like using wacky stuff. And so sometimes I will, I will be like, I want to use this team because I like this Pokemon and that's not the best way to get results. Um, additionally, you should really consider the format that you're building for. Uh, a best of one tournament is going to be different than best of three. I took best of five because I'm an idiot and I was very busy, but so I meant best of three, uh, best of five too. Like, Japanese nationals almost every year, to my knowledge, have been best of one for the majority of the tournament. And so the teams that do well there often have really wacky stuff that people like because you, you win a game off of a surprise move. And that's really, really, um, that's really valuable. Uh, in general, base stats matter. It's not this isn't like a hard and fast rule. Don't take too much stock by this because like there's a lot more that goes into a Pokemon than its stats. Um, but generally, the general version of this is that like if you have a Pokemon that's weird and it looks like a version of a Pokemon that's already being used. Maybe consider why you should use the lesser used Pokemon, right? Um, sometimes an, an advantage is significant enough to use a worse Pokemon. So for example, Arcanine is still has a niche here, even though Incineroar is typically thought of as a better Pokemon. Um, and that's because it's faster and it has faster, and the speed helps a lot with Snarl and Will-O-Wisp. And maybe you run Bulldoze to activate your own weakness policy, or you run Choice Band, or you run Choice Specs, or I don't know. I don't know. There's stuff you can do with, with Arcanine, but that Incineroar cannot do. But, you know, back in the day, I really wanted to use Chemeco, but, you know, Cresselia was better in every way. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to shout out a couple team builders who I think, who are my personal favorites, who've been influential over the years. I've started the ones with uh, world champions. Um, Seijun, obviously. Seijun is an amazing, amazing team builder, known for more of a hyper-offensive style, although that changes. Um, I wouldn't say his 2014 Worlds was that hyper-offensive, although it did have Scarf Gardevoir, Talonflame, and Garchomp, yeah. But Asian has really cool teams and is able to be really creative. Ray, obviously, I also put in parentheses Japan because I know Ray was always saying that a lot of his inspiration came from Japan um, and Japanese players, but obviously Ray deserves the credit. So, yeah. Um, starting, I, I put 2011, that's wrong. That should have been 2010. I was just thinking of when I was playing. Um, but yeah, it should be 2010. Um, when Ray's the three-time world champion for a reason. So, yeah, his 2011 team was one of the coolest ones I've ever seen. So he definitely deserves the credit uh, for that. Shoma is an amazing builder brought magnezone to the onog invitational in 2017 <laughs> this isn't when they died this is just when they were like most known most popular and i didn't double check all these years so uh yeah ashton is a crazy team builder he's been playing i believe since 2014 he has he used to use like ridiculous stuff like actually ridiculous like what stuff now he generally plays more standard but he still has it in him to do goofy stuff sometimes so yeah that's cool Anas Shekhar uh, is a player who has been around since, I think, actually 2010 he started, so that 2011 is wrong. Um, he goes on and off. He's not always playing all the time, but he generally, he's someone who's, like, very hit or miss, I think. Like, he, but when he's hit, he's very hit. He was one of the first users of Tapu Fini and one of the first people who, like, realized Tapu Fini could be good. I think he definitely could have won the 2012 World Championships. Um, he had a he had a really cool team back then. He, he comes in and out, like, doing cool stuff. Um... So yeah, Tommy is a personal favorite of mine. I really respect him as a player and as a person. He's a great guy. Um, and he 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 was one of like the new age, new age being like, I don't know, 2017 is when I kind of first realized how, how cool his teams were. So I really respect him. Angel was a huge driving force back in the day, 2014, 2015, does a lot of really cool stuff. Um, he really, he really enjoyed Clefairy. 
Uh, he also, I believe, was a pretty big force in the team that Jody Azarelli used to get second at the World Championships in 2014. Yeah, so he's, he's a good guy. And then Harrison Saylor is a personal favorite of mine. Um, he, nobody, like, I, Harrison, I feel like, is probably the best player to never qualify for Worlds. He, like, the qualification system was way harder back in the day. You had to get top four at Nationals. And Harrison Saylor got top eight twice, which is unfortunate, to say the least. So, yeah, he, but he was a really, 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 really good team builder. I can't trust that enough. He had some amazing stuff. Current team building bosses, I say, like players who are really good, I think. Justin Ramirez, um, underrated player. I don't think people realize how good this guy is. He, his T, he got top, he top cut both Dallas and Collinsville regionals. And then his T, he built the team that uh, Andrew Ding used to win Collinsville. And he also built the team that Andrew Ding beat in top four. So, He's very good. He had three teams in top eight. David Kutesh is very, very, very good uh, team builder. I think underrated. He does a lot of cool stuff. He was the one, if you've ever played against Gravity Gothitelle, no, Gravity Dustclops and Hypnosis Gothitelle, that's him. If you played against Roserade, it's honestly, I have a feeling it's because of him. Um, yeah, I, I have actually never, I don't think I've ever talked to him, but he seems like a nice guy and I, his building is really good. Benji Wang also got second at Dallas and Top Cut Collinsville as well. I don't know that much about Benji. I don't think I've ever spoken to him uh, for a lengthy period of time, but yeah, he's obviously doing very well this format. Trailer and Karis and myself. I didn't really want to include this, but I did. So shout out, shout out to the boys. Um, this is a group of players who are doing well. First at Dallas, second at um, Collinsville. Um, so that's solid. And then Eduardo, of course, Eduardo Cunha. Happy birthday, Edu. Happy birthday, great builder. And of course, there's, and I, you know, I, I, like I said, I've been very busy, so I left some people off of this, so I forgot. My bad. But I, I'm glad I, I remembered. Uh, Alex Gomez and Eric Rios have been working together for years. I think, um, I think since at least 2017, and these guys I really respect, they're very strong builders, and I feel like they're always in top cuts. Um, they actually had to play each other recently at the last European regional ever, rest in peace, Pokemon. Um, so, yeah, these are just some, some team building players who I think are really good now. I don't, th and Seijun, of course, I didn't include anybody who I mentioned here. Um, like, Seijun, you could still consider. Shoma, I don't know what he's doing, but I'm scared of him. Yeah, so, I think I mentioned most people here. Um, yeah, I don't know. Oh, that's it. Okay, well, that's the end of the lecture.